Hello! Today we're going to continue our discussion of reactions and we're going to consider several things that impact reactions, uh, all of which are, are kind of easy to think about and quick to think about, so we're going to talk about three of them all at once. And so our three big ideas today are one, to consider what are the effects of changing pressure on reactions? Two, what happens when you have inerts in the system? And finally, three, what does the reaction going forward actually mean? Um, and we're going to consider through these a couple of problems of the day, all tied to our favorite reaction, steam reformation of methane. Let's First, and most complexly for today, perhaps, we're going to talk about what happens when you change the pressure of a reaction. And you may wonder, well, you know, high pressure, I've heard of reactions running at high pressure, so maybe that means higher pressure is always a good thing. Um, but turns out it's a little more complicated than that. It's not always good, it's not always bad, in fact sometimes it has no impact whatsoever. And so uh, when we're looking at a reaction, uh, our governing equation for what is happening at equilibrium is that the equilibrium constant is equal to e to the negative delta g adjusted for temperature over rt and then that is equal to the product of all of the fugacities in the mixture uh, divided by the standard state fugacities raised to the power of uh, their stoichiometric coefficients and uh, that's how we look at it often when we're thinking about it uh, in the first place. And then if it's a liquid, we usually sub in uh, activities there. And uh, when it's a vapor, we often look at it in terms of ideal gas, if we can assume that. So our two big choices, as I just recapped, are, and, and these choices are at we'd call low P. So that's when uh, ideal gas is, is valid. Um, ish. Uh, so we, we could choose to model this as uh, xi times gamma i. That's the activity approach. And uh, that's raised to the new i power. And what you see here is that pressure doesn't really appear in this equation. Um, if uh, there are, there can be pressure effects on a reaction that occurs in solution in a uh, liquid or mixed liquid solid phase. Uh, but that only really happens at extremely high pressures, like really high pressures. Um, if you have something where uh, one, react one reactant is a gas and everything else is a liquid, then the pressure uh, likely will matter and we'll have to think about that. If we have a reaction that's happening exclusively in the vapor state and we assume ideal gas, that means the uh, ratio of the fugacities turns into yi raised to the new i times pressure, the overall pressure for the system, raised to the sum of all the stoichiometric coefficients. And this is the crux of the matter saying every reaction could be different because it really depends on what the stoichiometric coefficients add up to. If the stoichiometric coefficients uh, are a positive number, then uh, pressure has a big influence and possibly growing influence. Um, if you have um, the stoichiometric coefficients as a sum of them as a negative number, it has a completely different influence, right? And sometimes the sum of the co stoichiometric coefficients can be zero, in which case the pressure does not matter at all. Uh, so it's going to change for every different reaction that you are considering. So let's look at this uh, for our steam reformation of methane and what do we expect the effect of pressure to be here? Okay, so what is the sum of those stoichiometric coefficients? And then what does it mean if we run this reaction at a tenth of a bar versus running it at one bar versus running it at 10 bar? Does that favor products? Does that favor reactants? What happens? So I want you to uh, go back and look at uh, our previous class where we had a setup of how many moles of each thing were in the reactor and, I, and uh, I want you to run that reaction again uh, solving that same set of equations uh, at whatever your favorite elevated temperature was but now make sure that you have worked into that solving the fact that the pressure is different 
and the impact of that pressure being different. And then we'll talk about it. Okay, so that's our first of our problems of today. Now let's briefly discuss what happens when you have inerts in your system. And you might think to yourself, well, you know, like, when am I ever going to have inerts, chemicals that do nothing in my system? And the answer is, this will happen literally all the time. And it will happen literally all the time because our two most common sources of uh, things that react uh, include air for oxygen, which means you get a whole bunch of nitrogen riding in, uh, or if you're doing a reaction in solution, quite often you're working in water or some other solvent where that is uh, you often, not always, but often an inert that just rides through. So we have to know how to deal with this. So let's go back to our favorite reaction, the steam reformation of methane. And let's uh, imagine that there's some nitrogen that has entered our system uh, along with the steam that came in. So how do we deal with this? Well, it's straightforward. We deal with it like we dealt with every other chemical in here. So we can write an expression for how many moles of uh, each species are present. And now we have to write an expression for nitrogen. So you've done this before. You could go through and fill this in yourself. I want to show you, though, for nitrogen, we have the moles of nitrogen are equal to the initial moles of nitrogen. And then there's no C-based thing right? Because it doesn't participate in the reaction. So you don't, it's not plus C, it's not minus C. That's it. There's nothing there. It's just N equals, you know, the number of moles of N2 always equals that same number of moles. But it's present. It's there. It's hanging out this whole time. So when you go to write an expression for mole fraction, for example, right, like Y of CH4 is equal to the number of moles of CH4 divided by the total number of moles, that N2 is there in the total number of moles. And that thereby has an impact on what you solve for when you get to the end. Not only does it change your initial Ys, it will change your final Ys too, because everything is diluted. And sometimes that uh, is a positive effect. Sometimes that's a negative effect. It depends on your reaction stoichiometry and the number of moles that you started with. Okay, so what I would like to invite you to do is to rework again this reaction, but let's uh, see what happens if you have some uh, nitrogen inert in the system. Let's say there were two moles of nitrogen in the system. What happens to your results in that case? Okay, does that help the reaction go forward? Does it hold the reaction back? And keep in mind that this uh, result will not necessarily be consistent. Uh, it'll depend on your reaction stoichiometry. One other thing I want to mention while we're here is that sometimes even when uh, adding an inert is uh, detrimental to a reaction we wish to have go forward, we might choose to do it anyway. And why would we do that? Well, one reason we might choose to do it anyway is that it's too expensive or cumbersome to separate stuff out. So, you know, it would be great to run a uh, gas-fired uh, uh, engines on nothing but pure oxygen, but we it's too much of a hassle to uh, purify air. So we, we deal with that nitrogen. Um, or uh, another reason we might do this is to actually slow or cool the reaction down. Uh, so some reactions that might otherwise run away and uh, generate too much heat or too much expansion for us to be able to uh, operate them safely, sometimes we run them diluted intentionally uh, to keep things cooler and slower. All right, so there you go. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about what it means for a reaction to go forward. Finally, let's get a little philosophical here today. What does it mean for a reaction to be proceeding in the forward direction? And there's probably something you learned about this uh, back in high school or in general chemistry. And that was, well, a reaction will be spontaneous. It'll proceed as written if uh, I calculate that the delta G, the change in free energy for this reaction, is negative. And that might lead you to believe that, well, the pivot point should be zero. Right? A delta G uh, of, that's positive, not spontaneous is written, negative, spontaneous is written, so zero is exactly where things uh, flip between each other. 
And as you probably saw, as we modified the temperature of the steam reformation of methane, that's not quite the case. That's not 100% of the story. You can have a reaction that produces products, even though the delta G that you calculate with this is um, a positive value or a value right around zero. So what's another thing that might be true? Well, what if it's K, the equilibrium constant, which uh, remember it has a ratio of products and reactants. So it seems like maybe when that's one, the products and reactants are in balance, maybe that is uh, when things are going forward. And the answer there, uh, also not quite. Um, so finally, another way we might consider this is, well, at equilibrium, are there more products than there were when we started? And uh, that turns out to be the one thing that is the right answer and universally true. If this is happening, then the reaction's going forward and we're good. Um, delta G, as I pointed out, um, the fact that the delta G is negative is good. That's promising. That indicates the likelihood that this is to proceed in the forward direction. However, that fails to take into account what you've done by putting, uh, by setting the composition, the initial composition of the reactor. It fails to take into account uh, pressure effects also. So it's a, it's part of the story, but it's not the full story. It's not everything that's going on. So uh, the, the activity, that is the composition, is super important to driving reactions forward or keeping them from going forward. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, rea uh, the equilibrium constant also, it's not a straightforward comparison of it to greater than or less than one. Um, and that's because uh, when we have the, the products and the reactants, our reaction stoichiometry factors into this. Right? We have some things that are squared or even cubed. Uh, we have some things um, that uh, have different compositions. So uh, K, we can learn something kind of by comparing K to one, the numeral one in our minds, but that doesn't always mean bigger than one is not always 100% forward and smaller than one is not always 100% not forward. So, um, so they're suggestive, not the full story. So think about, you gotta solve it basically. It's about the products. We can drive a reaction forward by choosing the composition uh, in the reactor carefully. We can drive a reaction forward sometimes, in some cases, by changing the pressure. And we'll put all these things together to see what is truly going on at equilibrium in our reaction. And so this is just a reminder, go back and look, steam reformation of methane. And honest, yes, there are other reactions in the world, but this one is a really good example here. Uh, steam reformation of methane, look at what you did to get to there to be more products than reactants and check what the K was then and what the delta G was then. And you'll see that it wasn't just a, a, a sharp cliff between zero and less than zero or one and greater than one. All right, thanks.